what you guys need to understand about politics is a lot of times what's happening, what you see in terms of what the polit politicians are sort of pushing for in the public eye is not actually what they're voting for behind closed doors. Welcome to the Cashflow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and the founder of Catani Capital Group. For the last two years, I've been studying alternative assets and now help solve the problem of creating passive cash flow for creators, influencers, and busy professionals by bringing you five episodes a week of easy to understand education in the world of passive investing. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Catani. Hope everyone had a great weekend and is having a great week. Happy hump day. We are rolling right along through May. I cannot believe it. It's uh, May 10th as you're listening to this. Uh, if you're like me, April flew by in a blink. So uh, it looks like May is rolling right along. Uh, and we love it, right? It's uh, a lot of things going on, a lot of excitement. Um, not a ton to get to in terms of business-wise. So I'm going to dig a little bit deeper on what's going on with the government in terms of uh, the debt ceiling and possible default for the U.S. government, which uh, has never happened. So hopefully, obviously, we can avoid that. That's that's obviously the goal. But if you've been following along, you can see that Democrats and Republicans are. It's not bipartisan when it comes to this uh, right now, the. Republicans really want to make some spending cutbacks in order to agree to raise the ceilings. And the Democrats just want to raise the ceiling without changing anything. Uh, Biden has a meeting uh, yesterday, had a meeting with uh, Republicans, uh, Speaker uh, McCarthy, to uh, Speaker Kevin McCarthy, to see if they... It's not really a negotiation from what I've been reading. It's just trying to get the ball rolling, which is scary because according to Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, we only have about three weeks left before we go into default. So it's it's definitely top of mind right now. And it's probably the most important thing happening. It would be far worse than any of these bank collapses so it's it's definitely something to pay attention to. So uh, let's break it down, right? Basically, what we're looking at is the the uh, U.S. debt uh, ceiling needs to be raised, and it needs to be raised every couple of years. This, this always happens, and typically there's no issue. But this time, the Republicans really want to. They, re they really want to have a cutback on spending. Uh, we're spending a ton on uh, military right now. I think it's about $800 billion. Uh, so they want to see some cutbacks. And one thing to keep in mind is when you raise the ceiling, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't approve new spending typically. It basically allows the Treasury to grow out and raise money which is really just selling more uh, bonds, basically more debt, right? And if we go into default, basically what that means is we're unable to pay all the government debt, which a lot of that is in treasuries. So if you're an investor in treasuries, you're sweating right now because if the U.S. government defaults, then you can't pay those. And, you know, they are pretty much expiring every day. I can't remember the exact number, but uh, it was very, I think it was like 60 billion. That that could very much be, be made up, but almost like 60 billion a day, the U.S. Uh, pays back towards treasuries. And that's just treasuries. That doesn't include any of the other debt that we have, debt to other countries and, you know, some of the other debts that we have. So, Currently, the debt ceiling is at $31.4 trillion. That's our borrowing limit. And we're looking to raise it another $2.5 trillion. So that would put us at 
basically $34 trillion uh, borrowing limit. So there are a few things that can happen. So again, president's meeting, trying to work things out. The president has said that, you know, he's open to negotiation in terms of spending cutbacks, but not with the ceiling being raised. So basically what that looks like is, hey, Republicans, if you agree to raise the ceiling, I agree to open up negotiations to cut back on spending, but they're not going to be mutually exclusive. So one of the things that could, could happen is what is called a discharge position. And if you've been following along, you may be familiar with this, but if not, I'm going to break it down for you. Essentially what a discharge position is, is it's where the House is minority party, in this case, the Democrats, uh, essentially re- essentially a petition that requires 218 uh, members. Right now, 213 are Democrats. So what that would mean is that they would need five more they would essentially need five more signat five Republican signatures in order to uh, get this approved. Now, from listening to some other podcasts, some uh, people who are far smarter than I am when it comes to these things, it's looking like this could be the thing that gets us through it. Uh, and what I've been explained is here's why. Basically, what would happen is. Uh, Speaker McCarthy would more or less, uh, you know, kind of uh, call out and sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically, what he would do is he would, uh, he would more or less shame, for lack of better words, the five Republicans who who did it uh, openly. But... What you guys need to understand about politics is a lot of times what's happening, what you see in terms of what the politicians are sort of pushing for in the public eye is not actually what they're voting for behind closed doors and what they're conversing about behind closed doors, meaning that a lot of times behind closed doors, they're supporting things that they wouldn't, that they say they don't support, uh, in public because it's actually better for the government or better for the country overall to agree on some things. And this is one of those things where if Republicans are too stubborn to, and and I said this in my last podcast about this topic, if Republicans are too stubborn to reach an agreement and we go into default, it would be an instant regret. I mean, instantaneously, like they would regret it so quickly because the government would, the country would collapse economically. And not to get too far outside here. In fact, I'll probably do an episode on Ray Dalio's New World Order. But basically the way we're trending is the US, uh, the US is losing its superpower, its, its status as a world superpower. And it eventually... And in this will be in our lifetime, in my lifetime, will no longer be the the world superpower. Already, allies and other countries don't want to be like us. Uh, not as open to negotiations and talking about things. You're seeing de-dollarization, especially in oil. Like it's happening, you guys. And this doesn't mean that the country is going to go into turmoil and you know. We're going to have another civil war and government overthrow. Although, as uh, somewhat of an anarchist, I'm not really sure that's the worst thing. But uh, I don't want to get too political or get into that, although this obvious topic is political. I'm not going to say which side of the fence I'm on. I will say that this would be very bad for the country to go into default and would only expedite the falling of the U.S. from its, uh, you know, world uh world power so what this discharge position would do and what some experts think is that if you get the five republicans to sign off on it 
while McCarthy would, again, shame them in public, behind closed doors, he would celebrate it because that would take all of the pressure off of him to have to push some bipartisan or bring a bill to the House to a vote because he is in charge of what gets uh, what gets brought to the House in order to vote on it. And he gets to say whether or not you know, uh, even if a bill comes from the Senate and goes to the House, he gets to determine whether or not the House is going to vote on it. So, and that's just my basic knowledge from what I understand. How that process works, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, so please, if I'm incorrect, please reach out and correct me. I, I'm more than happy to to be corrected and and to make any corrections to my statements. But from what I understand, that's the case. So... From what I understand with this discharge position is it would basically take all of the pressure off him and, you know, publicly he would shame them, but behind closed doors, he would actually be, uh, be happy because then this would all be settled and it, it wouldn't reflect on him to whether or not you know, he had to bring the vote. And because if he continues to deny the bill that raises the ceiling, then, and the country goes into default and we absolutely collapse, then obviously the spotlight would be on him because it's up to him to bring that bill to the house to vote. So do you guys see how that works? Basically it's a way to circumnavigate him. He would, you know, ultimately pretend it's a bad thing and, and be upset with the five Republicans that signed it. But really, behind closed doors, he would be very, very happy because it's passed. We're not going to go into default, and the pressure is taken off of him. And, you know, he's not going to be shamed because he didn't bring the bill uh, to the House to get voted on. So that's what we're looking at right now. Obviously, I'll keep you guys updated. We'll see what happens, you know, as news comes out from the Biden talks with the other five Republicans, like I said, including McCarthy. Once word comes out from how those discussions went, I will update you guys. Those that what comes from that meeting is going to be massive in terms of where things head, right? Is the ball rolling? Are negotiations happening? Or are we still, you know, sort of gridlocked and there's been no movement. So that's really all I have for the day. I just wanted to give you guys a quick update on where we're at there. Uh, obviously, I encourage you guys to follow along. Uh, I personally read the Wall Street Journal. That's my favorite. Uh, a lot of other great sources when it when it comes to this, you know, obviously this is this is all objective, right? Be careful reading blogs and you know op eds, right? You want to try to be objective. Now, certainly. Every news outlet has its biases. We know this. But one thing I really like about the Wall Street Journal is you can get both sides. So, you know, you can get analysts who, you know, are on one side or the other and get different opinions. Again, even though I love the Wall Street Journal and they really do a great job of financial and economic reporting, Everything's worth a grain of salt. It's very, very important that you read every single day. That will allow you to truly formulate and determine, you know, which side of the fence you. I'm sure you lean on one side or the other already. What I mean is it will allow you to derive your own opinions on what's happening and and therefore stay informed. So that's really the biggest thing is, is you know, don't take everything face value, but it's very, very important to read and pay attention. Um, so you're informed and the more informed you are as an investor, the more calculated and educated your investment decisions are. So there you have it. That's um, I'll step off the soapbox now. Thank you guys as always for listening. Please, 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 you guys go to the cashflowchronicles.com right now. Seriously, go on, go on your phone if you're listening. If you're driving, please don't pull up your phone right now. But as soon as you can, go to the cashflowchronicles.com and get on the list so that you can stay up to date with the deals. I have got some exciting stuff rolling out. 
and some of it, uh, some of them will only be available to the list. Now, I talked about the oil and gas deal. That, of course, is going to roll out to the list. Uh, could potentially, we'll kind of see how much uh, interest I get. If that fills up quickly, uh, then I will not be putting out any ads. But it's possible that I put out some ads uh, as well for that. But the others, you will have to be on my list for. So go join the list. I want you guys to be involved. Also, you got to schedule a call with me because if if 506Bs come up, we've got to have an established relationship. And if you're a referral, like, you know, you know someone that I know directly, I have been told by an SEC attorney that that is okay. However, I do want to talk to you. I want to discuss with you because I want to understand what it is you're looking for so that we can make sure that we get the right deal to you. But if you're not, if I don't know you, if we've never spoken, I cannot bring you into a 506B opportunity. So it's very, very important that you go and you schedule a call with me. You can also reach out to me on Instagram, of course, at Johnny Katani, uh, J-O-N-N-Y-C-A-T-T-A-N-I. Thank you guys so much for listening. Enjoy the rest of your week. As always, I will talk to you on Friday. Have a great time. Be safe. Be smart. Educate yourselves. And I'll talk to you later. See ya. Thank you again for tuning in. Who do you know that wants more cash flow? Share this episode with them so you can grow your cash flow together. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you're subscribed on your platform of choice so you never miss a new episode. Go to KataniCapitalGroup.com to learn more.